Good afternoon, everyone. How are we all today? Um, my name is Brianne Roth. I am the Public Programs Coordinator here at the Nantucket Historical Association. And I'd like to thank you all for coming today and to welcome you here for our sixth Food for, food for Thought. Um, as always, we'd like to thank the MS Worthington Foundation and that media sponsorship is generously provided by Novation Media. Please take this moment to silence your cell phones um, so as to not disturb um, today's presentation. And on to today's speaker, Greg Margolis. Born into a foodie family in Philadelphia, Greg was raised to be a chef. He received his first egg pan at the age of seven, and during high school, Greg worked at a local indoor farmer's market as a chicken butcher. When it came time to choose a college, Greg enrolled in the Culinary Institute of America's four-year culinary program, focusing on culinary arts and restaurant management. After college, Greg moved to a small resort town in Colorado, where he worked in both the front and the back of restaurants and res resorts. In 2005, Greg moved to Nantucket to work as a sous chef with C chef Chris Freeman at Toppers at the Wabinet. Since then, Greg has worked at Sfolia, Met on Main, Moore's and Farm, and started his own private chef and home meal catering company. Greg is happiest in the kitchen and is excited to share his thoughts on the new culinary center. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Greg Margolis. Great. Hello. Thank you so much for coming. Can you hear me okay? All right. Good. I'm going to make sure the microphone's in the right spot. <clears throat> wow. Well, it's touching to see so many people show up to, to hear me talk. I, I really appreciate it. So thank you so much for coming out. Um, as she mentioned, my name is Greg Margolis, and with my wife, Joy, we are the owners and operators of Nantucket Culinary Center and Corner Table Cafe. This is a great honor for me to be asked to, to come out here and talk and, and share my, my thoughts and my knowledge. And it's a great pleasure for me to not put on my chef clothes as soon as I wake up. Uh, it's the first time that I think twice now since, uh, since we opened that I didn't put on my chef clothes first thing in the morning. So it's, it's, a, it's a real pleasure and I'm, I'm happy, so happy to be here. So to give you just a little bit of a, a background of myself and, um, and a little more information than that little introduction gave me, um, as far as being uh, raised and born into a, a culinary family, my father owned a restaurant before I was born, and after I was born, he was a cookware salesman. He was a sales representative and sold cookware to department stores and did demonstrations um, in live, live demonstrations in department stores. If anybody's ever been to Bloomingdale's around Christmas time, there's always somebody cooking something, trying to get you to buy the pan. And my father did that in support of his business and, and brought me along from a, from a very young age. So as, uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, I got my first egg pan for my eighth birthday. When I was nine, I, uh, I accompanied my father to a cooking demonstration at a store called Redding China and Glass, which is in, so, you know, outside of Philadelphia. And it was the 80s, and they were really big on, on stir fry. And my father sold a cookware line called Rewoko, uh, which is still around, but they were selling woks. And, his big sales pitch was that uh, stir frying was so easy even a child could do it and had me on the floor of the department store stir frying garlicky green beans and, and giving out samples for the gas and, and selling lots of woks. So I, I'd like to think I have a little bit of responsibility in the stir fry craze of, of the 80s. I don't know those woks are probably sitting in the bottom of everyone's cupboard just collecting dust at this point, but we, we certainly used ours a lot and it was a good experience for me. Growing up, I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of families kind of push the idea that they want their kids to be doctors or lawyers or people of, of great wealth and great importance. And in my household, there was nothing more highly revered than a chef. So every night before dinner, we would watch the uh, PBS Great Chef series was always on. I believe at 6:30 while we cooked dinner, and then 7 o'clock with Jeopardy, and then 7:30 we ate. So, and this was, I was fortunate enough to grow up in a home where we did eat a home cooked meal every night, whole family together, always a, always a meat, always a veg, always a starch, and always some, some snacks that were put out, usually smoked oysters or sardines before dinner. So I did grow up around food and around what I consider to be high quality food. In my family, we planned dinner while we were eating lunch, and during dinner we planned where we were going to eat the next day. Whenever my family got together, always about food. My greatest holiday memories are always about food and 
and I just really have high, highly revered food and, and the people who cook for a long time, whether it's a chef in the Great Chef series or, or Julia Child or, or James Beard or, or all of the, the historic greats. I've kind of been a student of, of culinary history for a long time. So I fulfilled my destiny and cooked all through high school and then went to college at the Culinary Institute of America, which is located in Hyde Park, New York. It's um, just outside of Poughkeepsie and about 90 miles north on the Hudson River uh, from New York City. It's a great place and I got a great education and I really enjoyed my time there. I really focused and really, uh, I think, applied myself and had a, a great education and have been able to, to turn that into, into my career. So it's uh, the old adage that if you find something that you love to do, you'll never work a day in your life. I feel like I work every day for my entire life, but uh, I still do love what I do and it's, it's still a real great pleasure for me to, to come into the kitchen every day. In my past, I've worked front of the house and back of the house, which are the terms that you're just within restaurants to be either in the dining room or in the kitchen, the kitchen being the back of the house and the dining room being the front of the house. And I've gone back and forth from different jobs and a lot of times in the same restaurant and really enjoyed both aspects of it. But the more time I would spend in the front of the house, the more I would remember and how much I love to cook. Every time I'd go from the back of the house to the front of the house, it was because of dreams of more free time and, and higher wages, and none of that ever came to fruition. <laughs> so I'm very happy now to be settling in, in the back of the house and settling into a, a really wonderful position and the, hopefully the, the rest of my professional career in, in this location across the street. I came to Nantucket in 2005 as a AM sous chef with Topper's Restaurant and it was just an incredible, eye-opening experience. During my education, I did an internship program at a, a really high-quality restaurant, but after that, I settled into uh, short order cooking, which is, short order cooking usually refers to, if in my case, it was breakfast and lunch, it was high volume, things that don't take too long to cook, so we're not selling steaks or fish or roasted things, it's, it's eggs over easy, it's toast, it's sandwiches, it's grilled things, and, I really love short order cooking and, and to be honest, I just really love to cook. When I came out to work at Toppers, I was coming from being the kitchen manager at a small size, high volume breakfast and lunch restaurant in Colorado. After school, I had moved out to Colorado to Steamboat Springs and really wanted to just ski bum and have some fun and I did that. But with the experiences that I got out there, I was able to talk my way into a sous chef position at, at Toppers, which at the time was the highest rated hotel restaurant in the state. And it was a great honor. And like most things that I do, when I take a big step in, in my life career-wise or family-wise or however it is, I, I was over my head right away, but managed to, uh, to climb back up and, and have a great experience with Toppers. I spent a year as the AM sous chef under Chris Freeman, and then when he left and purchased Oren Moore, I spent another year as the AM sous chef under Chef David Daniels. Um, and my third year, I transferred to the front of the house and became the dining room manager at Topper's Restaurant, which was another wonderful experience and really introduced me to the Nantucket summertime clientele. Um, and I had been kind of in the back and not seeing it as much as I was able to see it once I moved into the front of the house and really opened my eyes to a lot of what Nantucket has to offer and a lot of what the clientele is looking for and it was a really a terrific experience. After three years, um, I was looking for additional experiences outside of the Wild Winnet and I took time to do some landscaping, which apparently is a rite of passage for anybody who's living on Nantucket. It's very important to spend at least one year landscaping, but with that time landscaping, I also spent time at Moore's End Farm and learned a lot about food production, both uh, traditional farming and organic methods um, but more or less just getting my hands dirty and seeing where food comes from. I find it really important to get a diverse education on what it is that I'm doing. In the years of my professional history, I've had a chance to work many different aspects of the restaurant, whether, like I said, the front of the house or the back of the house, in lead positions as a chef, in line positions as a cook, um, as a server, as a restaurant manager, as a bartender, and I'm trying to utilize all of those experiences and skills to bring to the Nantucket Culinary Center a really diverse experience and, and hopefully provide a, a great service to the community. After my first year at Toppers, I was very fortunate to marry my wife, Joy, who's sitting in the front row here. We're gonna try and embarrass her a little bit later, but she's telling me I need to go on. As soon as I mention her, she pushes me right past it. 
But we were married here in 2005. Um, our first child was born three years later, and then another 19 months after that, our second child. So we have two children now on the island, both uh, growing up here, ages seven for the boy and five for the girl, which has been a great, wonderful experience. Again, over my head initially, but I think we're, we're doing better now. <laughs> and we really love Nantucket. Nantucket's someplace that we once tried to move off of Nantucket, and the second we got on the boat, we knew we made a mistake and, and turned ourselves around as quickly as we could to get back here. Uh, we have a real passion for the community and for the town, for the natural beauty of the place, and, and we just we think it's great. And another reason we're so excited to have the opportunity we have with the Nantucket Culinary Center and Corner Table. So a little bit about the Nantucket Culinary Center and the Corner Table and how that came to be. As I mentioned in the introduction, we started three years ago, or I guess it's almost four years ago now, a, um, a private chef and small catering company. I had gotten really frustrated with some experiences that I had professionally and just really wanted to go out on my own. And we did a little soul searching and decided what it is that we wanted to do. And we decided that if we had all the time and money in the world, we would throw the best parties. And so dinner parties, catering, and private chef service was born. And it started off slow, but became very successful, I think, for a small business with only two employees, myself and my wife, and occasional helpers. And as it continued to grow over three years, we started to look for a brick and mortar, something that we could do to help our business grow to the next step. And during this process, we found out about Remain Nantucket's uh, had released a recommendation for a proposal, an RFP, which is a common nonprofit tool. So Remain had purchased this great building, had through their own independent research and, and focus groups decided that they were going to create a, a culinary center, a place for all of the, the wonders of Nantucket's culinary experience to kind of be centered. And they were looking for someone to run that. So there was a competitive bidding process. And fortunately, it was in October, and we had some time on our hands. And we spent a lot of time focusing on designing a, a business plan, working our pro forma budget, and securing financing for our portion of the, uh, the business. And we submitted that. And this would have been one of the dates that was October of 2014. So October 2014, we submitted our business plan. And uh, two months later, on Christmas Eve, we were notified that we were going to be awarded the lease for 22 Federal Street, at which point we came in and had a lot of consultations and opinions and conversations back and forth on the, the finishes of the building and the usage of the building. Um, and we couldn't have been more excited. It was a really wonderful last year that we were involved with the, the final production. and what is now the final project of the Nantucket Culinary Center. And we couldn't be any happier to be tenants in that building and to have remain as, as our landlords. So I want to go over a little bit about the building. Hopefully, has any, anybody been there yet? Yeah. All right. Well, thanks. That's terrific. Um, and a lot of people have only been to the ground floor and to the, the Nantucket Corner Table. So the building consists of two complete businesses, both owned and operated by, by Joy and I. And, the upstairs two floors are the Nantucket Culinary Center, and the ground floor is the, Nan or the Corner Table Cafe, located at the Nantucket Culinary Center. But they are separate businesses. So I'm going to start from the ground up, as we are trying to build our business from the ground up. And we're going to get into the Corner Table Cafe. So the Corner Table Cafe, as part of um, our agreement and our lease, is committed to being open year-round and open into the evening hours. Part of the research that Remain did before putting out their RFP for this particular building was all the feedback that they got is that if you don't want to be at a bar and if you don't want to be at a high-end restaurant, there are very few places you can go once the sun goes down or in the evening at all in Nantucket. You know, a lot of what we hope to, to create with this culinary center or institute, as we sometimes call it, is kind of a, a campus feel. And Remain sponsors um, a lot of uh, student share programs with UMass Boston uh, and other UMass programs where they bring students over to spend time here in the wintertime. And that was one of the, the biggest pieces of feedback. There was no place for them to go in the evenings. No place that they could sit around, not feel the pressure to spend money or to drink, and to have a nice, quiet, and comfortable spot. So that's one of the reasons that the Nantucket Corner Table, or the Corner Table, sorry, is, uh, is open into the evenings. Right now, our hours are 7 a.m. to 9 p.m., seven days a week. 
and we will extend our hours in the, in the summertime to go even later into the evening, whether it's 10 or 11, I think is an ongoing conversation, but we'll certainly be open later. We're hoping to be a place for people to meet in the evening to enjoy dessert, coffee, tea, a place for people who either don't want to drink or are not old enough to drink to come in and, and have a nice, nice, safe place, a nice experience. We have lots of public bathrooms. The building actually has seven bathrooms, <laughs> which was uh, un unavoidable. As much as we tried to get rid of one or two of them, they give us more, more room for refrigeration and storage. We have two handicapped accessible bathrooms on every floor and an office bathroom as well. We're very proud of our seven bathrooms. <laughs> and please feel free to come in and use them anytime. <laughs> I put that out to all of you. Um, as I know, <laughs> the bathrooms downtown could, could be a bit of an issue. But we really focused in the cafe on portions of the, the market which we thought were underserved on Nantucket, specifically the grab and go portion of the market, which is home meal replacements, another key word that we use within the industry. But the idea that you can come in, we have a really large refrigerated display case, and grab food that you can take home and heat up for dinner. Grab things to take away and eat later, eat at your office, grab salads that are, we're doing beautiful salad and mason jar program where everything's all done for you, just dump it out into a bowl and toss it up and you have a complete meal. So everything is scratch made, everything is not, right, right now I have a couple employees, but in the beginning everything was made by me. But uh, I still oversee and I'm really happy with the quality and the food that we're putting out. I'm very proud of the grab and go food that we do there, as well as great coffee. Uh, we've been working with uh, Nantucket Coffee Roasters to come up with our own blend and are, again, very happy with the coffee that we're, that we're putting out and the lattes and, and higher end coffees. And we have a great baker now and we're doing some really great baked goods, as well as we have uh, just hired a woman who specializes on, in gluten free baking. So now we're able to expand our gluten free offerings and nutritional vegan offerings to a, a much bigger extent. The cafe is very comfortable. We worked really hard on that with the couches and just a lovely place to be. So I do appreciate that. It looks like most everybody's been there, but we'd love to have you back as well. And if you haven't been into the upstairs floors, the next floor up is going to be our, our demonstration kitchen. The demonstration kitchen is the best way to explain it is that it's set up as if you were watching a, a live cooking program. It's a stage kitchen. It's got all the, the, tri the bells and whistles of the finest appointed home kitchen. The Sub-Zero refrigerator, the, uh, the Wolf stove and range, and in replacement of the traditional 45 degree mirror, we now actually have a, um, a high-def high TV on an angle with a camera pointed right down on the stove. So we're able to do cooking demonstrations in front of a large crowd where you can actually look right down onto the stove. We've also utilized the room for a multiple of um, different events, lecture series, uh, and things like that where people needed a space maybe not quite as grand uh, as this, but a smaller, more intimate space. And we have a really nice um, audio-visual PA system, so we're able to put things like this on our screen there as well. And it's just a really wonderful room, as well as using it for cocktail receptions, parties, and, and things of that. So the room has tables and chairs that can be moved around in lots of different configurations. But in general, it's just a, a wonderful space. It's very warm and welcoming. And this is a separate entrance from the cafe. So if you've gone to the, down the stairs into the cafe, go onto the porch and, and up the stairs into the, the demonstration kitchen, the door is always open, the lights are always on, and we're fortunate enough to have events going on there on a pretty regular basis considering the, the time of year that it is. We've been, again, really, really pleased with uh, the turnout and the, the people who have shown interest and in, in come into the building. The top floor, again, the doors are always open, so please come by for a visit when, whenever you like. We'd love to show it off. And I guarantee you, I'm in the kitchen or Joy's in the office, at least until the kids get out of school. So the top floor is our interactive teaching kitchen. So whereas the first floor is a demonstration room, No, that's the right slide. <laughs> I know what the next slide is. That's the right slide. All right. <laughs> Very rarely am I right. I think this is going to be one of those times. Uh. <laughs> so that is the interactive teaching kitchen, and that's where we do actual hands-on classes. So has anybody taken a class yet? I see one person. What? There we go. So we've, ta we've taught a couple of classes. We're, we're adding on to our class schedule at all times and really now just continuing to see what works. 
it's been for us a really, really wonderful and busy winter. And we would consider the, the entirety of the winter kind of our, our soft opening. And, and what a pleasure it's been to be able to kind of work out all of our, our wonderful kinks and continue the learning process with a, with a local community that we hold so dear. It's been a really, really great winter. I know that a year ago when we were discussing whether or not to open in January or wait until the spring, it was very important for us to open in the wintertime and, and really be a place that was going to be here, start our year-round commitment right away. Um, so the interactive kitchen up there has two more complete kitchens. So two more full sets of ovens, two more full sets of stoves, and then just one refrigerator, but it's, it's a big refrigerator, so <laughs> there's plenty of room for everything that we need up there. So there is where we do these interactive classes. We also do demonstration dinners. So we have groups that either open to the public or we've had people that have already booked private dinners in there where they come in, do a little demonstration about the meal that they'll be eating, and then they go and they, they sit down in the dining room. So there's that picture in the bottom right is a picture of our dining room. That picture makes it look really large. I, I think it's, it's medium size. The picture is just, I must have a great wide angle lens. But it's a beautiful dining room table. Again, like the kitchens, it's designed to feel like home. It's designed to be as a, um, as a well-appointed Nantucket home. So I hope we all have the fortunate enough one day to live in a well-appointed Nantucket home. But for us, this, this is our well-appointed Nantucket home. Um, and it's really beautiful. It's a really comfortable dining room. The interior decorating was done by the looms, and the millwork and build out was done by um, house fitters. And they've done just a really terrific job. The place is it's great, and we already have a, a good number of bookings coming up for the summertime, so we're very excited about that. Is that the slide you were hoping for? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've had a chance to utilize the, um, the building for lots of great stuff, including our own schedule of things. We've also made it open to the community. We've let a lot of nonprofits utilize the building for little or no cost, as it's kind of our, our mission and our hope that we would rather see the building in use than have it sit vacant at any time. So we've had the pleasure of, of letting the building out to be used for the One Book, One Island has used it. Sustainable Nantucket has used it several times for board meetings and for event planning. The palliative and supported care of Nantucket, the PASCON, uses it on a, a fairly regular basis. And again, they just need a room. You know, a lot of these smaller nonprofits don't have a boardroom, don't have a meeting space. And I know from our experience of trying to start a business and trying to do any work, not having a place you can sit down and, and utilize has been really difficult for us. And we are very excited to be working on and developing something that will be able to be used and used for that. Um, Nantucket Community Foundation, Nantucket Community School, Nantucket Community Health Alliance, Nantucket, Nantucket Soccer Association, and the Mariah Mitchell are a list of some of the community groups who have already used our space. And again, we do everything we can to, to get as many people in there as possible. And we've been very, very happy with the response. What we have planned for the future, now you have the background up until now, we are here for the long haul. Nantucket is, is our community, it's where we are married, it's where our children are born, and where we hope to be for, for the longest of times. So for the future, for the more immediate future, coming into the summer, as we've been receiving a lot of interest in what's the classes, we get people calling and say, I'm gonna be there on August 18th, what are you teaching? You know, and then, we are gonna focus very hard on introducing our summer programming right around Memorial Day. So we'll be able to release a schedule for the majority of the summer. It's going to include recreational classes. It's going to include children's programs for different age groups, children camps. It's going to include things that are just designed for fun and entertainment. Things that are designed really focused on, on educational basis. Things really designed to highlight the Nantucket culinary world. We hope very much to be in complement and not so much in competition with all of the other local restaurants and businesses that, circus, that, that focus around Nantucket and the Nantucket food. Um, and we've made the restaurant or the, the building available, made it known that the other chefs on the island, that this is a facility that they can use if they want to do demonstrations. We will be doing chef demonstrations in cooperation with Nantucket. Um, with, with a sustainable Nantucket. They have done chef demonstrations in the past as part of their, their farmer's market. We're gonna take it the next step forward. They're gonna be able to utilize our space for some real great chef demonstrations. 
Um, but again, it's very important that we are something that's seen as a, a complement to Nantucket's culinary world. We hope very much that we will be able to bring in people into the shorter seasons and expand the season for Nantucket in a little bit for the, the culinary the culinary minded, I guess would be the right term. For anybody who lives here year round, you know that the best foods, fruits and vegetables coming out of the farms really don't start coming in until September. It's depending on the heat of the summer, but a lot of times it's September before the tomatoes are, are really great. We might be out of corn, but the tomatoes and fall vegetables and anybody who's a chef knows that the fall is the greatest time to cook. So we're gonna hopefully focus a lot of that um, fall food and, and try to pull in those, those, those kind of shorter seasons. We're going to work with guest houses and I've already started to do some planning where we can focus weekends where they'll, they'll come in and I mean, right. <laughs> where they'll come in and spend a weekend and participating in, in culinary activities. So whether it's family scalloping season in October where we can go out, go raking together, come back, learn about opening the scallops and then learn how to eat the scallops, how to cook the scallops, and sit down to a great dinner of scallops. It's just a really, one of the things that we're really focused on. We will have our full website. Right now we have a splash page, and then tuggaculinary.com, and you're welcome to go there and look at our classes that we have coming up, as well as signing up for our, uh, our mailer, our direct email mailer, so you can keep up to date with everything that we're doing. Um, and the complete website will be up right around Daffodil Weekend. We hope to really aggressively and wonderfully push our, our business kind of into a, a full and complete grand opening for, for this summer season. As I said before, the winter has just been such a great learning experience for us and we've just been so, so pleased with the results and so pleased with um, the support that we've gotten from the community and, and can't wait to continue on. How am I doing on time? Is that a time? Please, come on up. No. Please. I just want to make sure that we mention um, that in, oh, yes, can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> is that we mention um, our collaboration is super important because we can't do it ourselves. And we've learned that really quickly. And this building is, um, it's going to be so important. So one of the pieces that I'm most excited about is the Foodie Weekend, which is going to happen in October with Sustainable Nantucket. And so they're coordinating it. They've already organized the, the family scalloping. They've already organized with us to come in and cook. So that's really, we, and I've said to all the bed and breakfasts and Sherburn Inn is using us, and is if you have a great idea, come tell me and then work with me on it, because we're learning. So that's, I just, that's the part that Greg is in the back of the house and he's not, um, I run things by him for menus, but quick and really it's what we're doing um, on that second floor in the office there to really create um, a community center. That's it. You have time, though. So you, How much can, time you can keep on. I just have to add How much that. more time do I have? You, have? you have a half an hour. I only, that was only a half hour? <laughs> Wonderful. Don't go crazy. Well, Maybe you can just do questions and they can, you know, go over for a coffee. And we'll go for <laughs> that, that, exactly. Is that all right if we go into questions now? I don't mean to ruin your lunch hour by only talking for a half hour. That never happens to me. So let's give a round of applause real quick. <laughs> and, and who has a question? Yeah, I was wondering if that building uh, has an elevator. That building has an elevator. Hey, okay. That building has an elevator. There's access on the on the ground level, so into either the cafe or any of the upstairs floors. So in order to act, there's a there's a sign pointing the way, but just walk right into that little courtyard area, and there's an elevator right there. Walk in, and I think for some reason we've had some malfunctioning with the door automatic door opener, but. It, would not, it, will, it, it, it still opens, it's still unlocked. And on that same topic, one of the things we're really excited about too, um, that courtyard, we're gonna be putting in a, um, a really wonderful living area. It's going to be similar and in the same spirit to our, our downstairs cafe with uh, couches and comfortable chairs and a coffee table. So we're designing the courtyard to be as if, again, that well-appointed Nantucket home yard. So we're gonna have really comfortable seats and a really, create a really wonderful space to sit outside and enjoy it. We have no plans right now to have table service. It'll just be an extension of the cafe. So go downstairs and, and grab whatever coffee, drink, tea, sandwich, salad, and enjoy them outside in, in our courtyard. And unlike a restaurant, we're not going to come in and encourage you to leave at any time. So as long as you're drinking coffee or having a tea, we're, we're so happy to have you in, in our space and to share that. Any other questions? We've got some over here. I'm going to come to you first. Do you charge rent for a meeting 
that might want to use your space? We have a sliding scale as far as rent or fees regarding the meeting. Um, it depends a little bit on the opportunity cost. If you want to use the, the building on a Friday evening when we could otherwise book it, there would have to be some sort of a fee. Um, if you wanted to make sure that there were coffee and tea and water and snacks and things set up, there'd be a fee associated with that. If you have, you know, a, a not, if you're a profit or a nonprofit, and depending on that, it also affects the scale. Um, but I can tell you that it's very, very reasonable as far as that stuff, especially if it's, if it is a nonprofit who needs a space for a board meeting, something like that. I know of the places that we listed, some of those people do charge. Uh, we do charge and sometimes it's, it's $50 just for the room rental fee because we have to clean up and set up. Um, sometimes it's a little bit more if they want coffee and tea and things like that. And again, a lot of times it's, it's during the day, when another, a time when it would be otherwise unoccupied. And that's especially in the, in the winter season. Especially been when I've seen people in the cafe trying to have a meeting around the couch and there's six or eight of them and they've already got their coffees, they're all set to go, but they're crowding. I said, go up to the dining room, there's no one up there. Especially during the day, we, so far we haven't had, we've had some luncheons, we have somebody prepping all the time to get ready for the dinner party at night, setting the tables and things. But if there isn't a dinner party that night, we've certainly, I've said to Pascon, you know, come up, don't, don't crowd around here, especially when it's lunch rush and there's a lot of people that are trying to get in and out. So. And for that, that kind of thing, there, there would certainly be, yeah, be no just, fee. Just, we're, just we're just happy enough to have a group of people who want to meet in our space and who want to utilize, come in and, and, and buy our food and our coffee. And, you know, we have tables upstairs that are always set up. And if people need a little bit more room, you know, we just, uh, right now, we just kind of cherry pick them out of the cafe. When we see people trying to look at blueprints on a, on a small table, we tell them to just, just come on upstairs. I came in a little late, so I don't know if you said, I was just interested in the history of that building. So I can give you the quick abridged history of the building. I'm, I'm not a huge student on the building. The building was built in 1870. Um, the, the one that was originally in the place went down in, in the fire, and with the, the, the depressed economy after the Great Fire, um, it didn't get rebuilt until 1870s. The building was rebuilt by, um, by a local carpenter and it had a, a bunch of different incarnations. I've heard people talk about at one point, they did hangings on the Broad Street side out of the second floor. I've yet to find any documentation to support that, but they, they assured me. And that was a, a woman who used to work in the building when it was a town building. The building's always lovingly been referred to as the Mooney Building, as uh, Robert Mooney, who is still with us, but I think well into his 80s at this point, had his law firm operated out of there. Um, Mooney family history is a very interesting one, which is, uh, yeah, we'll get into that later, but uh, it's, you know, the original Mooney was, was shipwrecked here on the British Queen, which is a, a fun bit of the history of that building. Um, after the Mooney building, the town purchased it and the town offices were located in there for several years. I think the beach offices and, and a couple others, but it, it became the building that you did not want to work in. It had low ceilings, it was filled with asbestos. Um, all the pipe insulation was asbestos and the building fell into disrepair um, about four years ago. Town tried to auction it off a, a couple times and until Remain finally put in a purchase, a, a, a bid that was accepted. So that, that's my knowledge of the formerly the, the Mooney building. Um, oh, sorry. She's got the mic. She's in charge of who answers now. Nice. Um, your cafe used to be Bookworks. That's true. Yeah, that was where the Bookworks originally opened, was in the basement of the, the Mooney building. It was probably the Mooney building at the time. Yeah. Well, she's got the mic. <laughs> Any outreach programs to uh, high school kids? Yeah, so Encour we were encouraging them into the uh, trade. Ab absolutely. So this is a question that we get a lot. So thank you for it. It's, it's something that people are very interested in. Our business plan, our idea as being a culinary education center, is really focused much more towards the home enthusiast, the person who loves to cook and wants to get a little bit better at it, the person who loves watching cooking shows and, and kind of wants to maybe take it to the next level. Our focus hasn't been students or young people who are looking for a career in the culinary arts. Right now, the high school program here has a really great program, which is now headed by Tom Proach, who was for a long time the executive chef of the, um, the club car. So he now has that program where he really focuses on kids and getting them prepared into a, a career in, in culinary arts. So we've been working with Tom Proach and trying to find some different ways to work with him and offer real world life experiences and work experiences for his students who are more focused on it. Uh, we will be doing summer programs kind of targeting towards the, the younger audience and kids like that. 
Um, as far as professional development for, for teenagers, we're trying just to make more, hopefully, work available for young guys who want to come in and be that kind of secondary chef during the culinary education class as a person to follow me around or follow the chef instructor around and, and be in support of that. But we have really just right now focused our educational programs on more of the, the home enthusiast. Um, we are super open to ideas and collaborations and we've met with Tom Proach several times and I think we, we actually had an event planned that he just postponed for a little bit but if you're familiar, the culinary students do um, a competition, a state competition every year and they just returned from the state competition a couple of weeks ago. We have plans in the near future to recreate that meal prepared by the students in the more professional atmosphere and, and offer them a chance to, um, to serve their meal to a, a group of, of island people who choose to, to come and support the, the, the Nantucket Culinary Program. It would be a fundraiser for the high school program as well. I just had an idea of an international educational series. There's a lot of new stuff in the grocery store that I never learned about or cooked, especially in the vegetable section. And I was thinking maybe a fun project for the winter would be weekly or monthly international series. What do people eat in Jamaica? What do they eat in Portugal? What do they eat in, if that's of interest to yeah, you? Yeah, I, I think it's of interest to the community. And another question that, that we get relatively regularly is people want to learn or they have somebody who's great at the, you know, the cooking of, of Brazil or the, the, the food of El Salvador or some of the other smaller communities out here. Um, I am not an expert with El Salvadorian food or or the cuisine of Brazil, and we are constantly on the lookout for adjunct teachers or people who are familiar with the product, and we put it out quite often. I think we have somebody scheduled. We have, sorry, hi. Uh, we have a, a Vietnamese um, woman who's coming out uh, right before Daffodil and for that whole week visiting uh, one of our current um, cooks, employees, employees um, Sky, and team so member. team member. Um, and so she's gonna, she's actually cooks in LA and does cooking classes, Vietnamese Laotian food. So that's gonna be, I think, gonna be fabulous. And she's gonna do a demo where we can fit more people and then go upstairs for interactive and even eat together. Um, and I think that um, the pupusas and the pupusarias that they're doing, the El Salvadorian food, that woman would love to come in and have people um, enjoy her food and learn about that staple of El Salvador. So I, I love it. I think that would be a fun. Uh, we, we think it's great and we'd, we, we'd love to find more people who can come in and teach the classes. I, I bought jackfruit last summer and I recently bought breadfruit and I, whenever I see something at the grocery store that I haven't tried before, I, I, I buy it and try to figure it out. At this point, I don't feel comfortable teaching a class on how to cook breadfruit though, which is, I still don't like it, but I'm trying. <laughs> Any other class? Great. I'm just curious if you have any housing for guest chefs or something in the building. You know, we don't have any housing. We barely have housing for ourselves as well. the, uh, the, the challenge on Nantucket. Um, but we do have uh, some stuff in the works to try to bring in some, some great chefs from around the country, some, using some of our networking to bring in great chefs. And when we do that, we'll be working. We've, we've talked a little bit with, um, with Wendy Hudson to utilize her guest house that she just built on top of, uh, somebody's going to correct me, I'm sure. No, but no, no. You know, we, we're trying to work with a lot of the guest houses, so as a cooperative thing, when we bring in the chefs, they can stay there. But we don't have any housing to offer directly to, to those people. But we do hope very much to be able to attract some real top-tier talent to the island to do demonstrations and events. And I'm cookbook just authors. Curious and cookbook about, authors, for sure. I, I'm curious about your dining room. Do you have to get a group together to, to make a reservation to use the dining room? I wasn't quite So there's, there's a couple of different ways that we've been utilizing the dining room. And, and again, what we've done so far and what we're going to continue to do in the future will continue to grow and the options will continue to grow with it. As of right now, the dining room seats 12 very comfortably. We've done a, a Tuesday night dinners with Greg series that have been well attended. And for those events, we just, we sell the tickets and it was, it started out as something for us to really get our, you know, work out the kinks in the building. Um, but it's been very popular. So we've continued to offer those. And, those are, for an example, a Tuesday night dinner series. We put it out on, on our social media and on our website and sell tickets to those. And you'd buy a ticket and you just need to be one person. And we sell 12 tickets. Um, and a lot of people have come to that, have had such a great time. They've called us the next day and booked it for 10 of their friends. So it's either way. So a lot of the cooking classes that we do culminate in a dinner 
with wine, paired with wine, in that same dining room. So if you were to sign up for any of the cooking classes that include dinner, that would be coming to dinner in that room. If you were to sign up for any of the Tuesday night dinner series, which we have and will continue to have into the summertime, I assume. Supper club. Supper club, we're calling it, pardon me. Um, then you'd come in and you just you could buy one or two or four or five tickets to it and not be committed to the entirety of the room. Otherwise, you're more than welcome to book the room for you know as few or as many people as you like. We have and, and design the menu to suit. So because of the limited size of our kitchen and our facility, we're not able to give you a menu as a typical restaurant would, but we're also able to design any menu that you like. Um, you know, it's more similar as far as a catering menu. We could, we could give you a couple of choices, but we'd have to know ahead of time. We don't have the big facility that will now enables us to have a, an a la carte menu where you can pick any of 10 different things as a, a typical restaurant would. But we'd be able to work on and design any menu that you like. Uh, we have a great staff, including me, who, <laughs> who can really work Pretty with... Only me, well, but we can work on any, any menu that you like, whether, you know, we've done events as diverse as um, Indian food. We've done some really great Indian food events and some that I'm passionate and love to cook. So we've done big Indian food feasts. We've done things as some simple and straightforward as, as roast chicken, pan gravy, mashed potatoes, just real simple things. Uh, we're going to start to work with a, a local sushi chef, and we're going to be able to do sushi nights where you could do it, book it for, for 10 people. Or there's also a sushi class right now on our, on our website. You can sign up for that. And for what I think to be a reasonable price. You can come in and enjoy sake paired with sushi as well as a little class leading up to it where you learn how to roll your own sushi. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah. do we have any final questions? All right, well let's give a warm of applause once again um, to Greg and Joy for um, putting together this presentation.